See? This came from, and I feel like this is timely, but this came from this space where I see a lot of people just be like, that's unethical. It's unethical what you're doing. And I just kind of got sick of that. So I wanted to kind of help people discriminate what is unethical and what you just don't like. Uh, Cause I feel like that's a lot of what I'll see is somebody would be like, ah, it's unethical. It's like, actually you just, that's just not something that you appreciate or you like, or it's just not something that you would do. That doesn't mean it's unethical. So it's not unethical. You just don't like it. Ethics, morals, and preferences. So what we're going to try to do is talk a little bit about um, how to discriminate between ethics, morals, and preferences and include some legal stuff with that. Uh, we're going to provide some examples on the intersection between those things. We're going to determine some skills to address those, and we're going to identify some strategies to promote an ethical environment because I feel like uh, we want to walk away with some stuff that is um, going to be helpful, than, more helpful than just going, um, by the way, that's unethical. I don't like that. Okay, so that's going to be the goal as we go through. Um, all right, so real quick discussion. You can put it in the chat. You can open up your mic, whatever you want. Um, but ethical decision making is not easy. All of us come across ethical dilemmas about every single day. Uh, we come across different scenarios, unique dilemmas. We, I can't imagine anybody has been trained on every single dilemma that could possibly occur, especially given when I started in the field, um, Instagram wasn't a thing. So there's that now. So we we live in that world, and now there's TikTok, whatever that might be. I'm too old for that. Uh, but these dilemmas put us in a position to make these snap decisions, right? We have to make decisions really quickly. We have to make decisions that are going to be helpful. And so my question to you all is, how do you make ethical decisions? Which I know is a big, broad question, but how do you go about making an ethical decision when a dilemma arises? Megan said, uh, analyze how code elements interact with one another. I love that because. There are so many, we're going to talk about that later, how they contradict one another sometimes, which is a lot of fun um, to work through that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the codes and figuring out where they interact and like which one might be the most harmful is kind of a fun, it's a fun game, right? <laughs> you ever have that where you're like, oh, it could be this or I could be discriminatory. I don't know. So um, you have those moments. So uh, grace, grateful to behavior analysts like Megan who have answered my calls for help. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, exactly. So having those folks that you can lean on and ask questions to. Uh, Michelle says, if I consult with one, uh, I might then consult with another to make sure and get another perspective. Yeah, having that like IOA a little bit, right, across that situation. Um, or even just getting different ideas because everybody's learning history is so different, right? So especially when it comes to the ethics code. So we have this idea of how we make ethical decisions. We have this process by which we navigate those contingencies and we navigate those decisions. But I think what ends up happening is, is that people still, even when we have that ability to do that, we get approached with this situation where somebody comes to you and says, that's unethical. And so my first thing that I think of is like, people keep using that word and they don't know what it means. And so we're going to start with kind of defining this a little bit and giving us a little bit of context by which we can start analyzing whether or not it is an actual ethics dilemma or it's just an issue of preferences. So uh, yeah, the ethics hotline is great too, right? For certain situations, for sure. I think um, Tom Freeman has now an ethics hotline as well through FIT. So there's that um, that just launched pretty recently. So you can have coffee with Tom and go over that. So let's start with just some really basic definitions to kind of orient to what we're going to talk about today. So ethics. The basic definition is moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. So I thought it was interesting that they put moral principles in there when we talk about ethics. Um, so that kind of muddies the water when it comes to our definitions a little bit, but we use the ethics code. We have these principles and these rules and these guidelines for making some of these decisions that help govern our profession, right? So, so I think that's probably the best way to look at our ethics code is it's going to govern our profession and guide our professional behavior. So, that's ethics, right? And so then we've got morals, okay? So morals tend to be a lesson, especially one concerning what is right or prudent that can be derived from a story, a piece of information or an experience or a person's standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what it is, or what is and what is not acceptable for them to do. Now, I'm gonna go with the second definition for this for the sake of our discussion, a person's standards of behavior, okay? Because that's gonna be the thing I think that, that really colors the experience of having those ethics discussions. You know, that person's standards of behavior, what they believe to be right versus what is in the rule versus what is actually ethical. That's where we see a little bit of this conflict. Okay. So, so we've now we've got ethics, which are the, the, the rules, the guidelines that govern our, our, our profession. Now we've got morals, which are a person's standards. Then we've got preferences. Preferences are a greater liking for one alternative over another. So 
we may have some um, professional values. We may have some guidelines. We may have some behaviors that we prefer or some, some processes where we pr prefer to engage in them um, compared to others. And so this is something that's important to know. It's like, what is my preference versus what I'm expected to do? And sometimes this gets confused as well. Um, I think you see this a lot in Facebook groups where people will be like, I don't like that. But they're, but what they're, they, but they're saying that's unethical, but they're actually saying they don't like something, right? So we have these preferences. We have to understand that and recognize that in the context. And then finally, we have this legal issue, right? So legal is of, based on, or concerned with the law. Because, and, and I, and I want to highlight this specifically because there are times where the most ethical thing is not the legal thing. And there are times where doing the legal thing might be more harmful, or there are times where um, the legal is the minimum standard and we can always do better with an ethical standard, right? So we have this like kind of funny conundrum that we are faced with where um, we have to still do something that is not harmful, right? Do good, do no harm. But then what happens if it puts our certification on the line or it tends to be illegal? So, now we have all these things. Let's go ahead and start looking at them. They intersect in all these different ways. They interact in different ways. So ethics and morals appear to be similar, but how are they similar? How do we find that, you know, somebody's personal beliefs tend to interfere with the beliefs of the field or like the guiding principles of the field? We see that happen. And we see sometimes ethics being preferences, right? I mean, in ethics discussions, do you see people, they tend to cite certain codes and not others? Like they kind of cherry pick that? Has anybody ever seen that where it's like, oh, you can't take a gift. It's like, you're literally billing fraudulently. So like you're worried about, you're worried, you're worried about accepting an ornament or a picture from a client. Like, so you'll see that where people kind of pick and choose, they cherry pick which ethics codes they really like or what they prefer. Um, and they might be in a situation where their preferences tend to shape or constitute their own ethics, but maybe not necessarily for the field. So we have this weird situation where everybody is kind of like, it's all interplaying, it's all influencing one another. And then we look at this issue of preferences versus morals and how they interplay, right? So a person's standards of behavior might be a set of preferences and have nothing to do with the ethics code, right? So you might have preferences based on your standards of belief. I like, I mean, I've been told specifically that I dress unprofessionally and that's a person's standards of belief, right? And also their preference, but is not an ethics issue, right? Like I can dress, as long as I'm not like naked when I show up to clients, we should be good, right? Like I'm dressed comfortably, all right? Functionally, I'm dressed functionally, all right? But that's an issue of morals and preferences. Like somebody will be like, it's unethical because you're dressed that way. It's like, no, that's just, you just want me to wear a suit. And you know, I, I can't pull off the Selena. I just, I'm not there, okay? So, and there are times where the most ethical thing to do or the moral decision isn't a legal one. Okay. So I think of this, like in Florida and in every state that I've ever worked in or like ever heard of, you know, I've always heard that um, we have these situations where um, we are mandated reporters, right? So something comes up, we're mandated reporters. Okay. What happens if you find uh, like maybe you're in a family home where marijuana is legal and you find a bag of weed on the coffee table. Are you supposed to call? How is that going to be more helpful for that family or harmful? Like, can you address that in a different way? Technically, legally, you are obligated to call because the drugs are in the, in the presence or they could be in the possession of the child. But what happens when you call DCF, you call Child Protective Services? Like, how is that helpful? That's probably going to be more harmful, right? So you look at these questions and you look at these situations and go, okay, well, what is the most ethical thing? Or what is it that I have to do that might not be the legal thing? So these are situations where they start intersecting, right? And it's frustrating because we have a hard time defining it. So we've got this like cool Venn diagram where it all kind of overlaps. And this is kind of how I feel about it. Whenever I see these things and we have these discussions, because you just get so frustrated with trying to figure out which one is the right thing to do. And we have that discussion a lot. And a lot of people like to tell you what the right thing to do is, right? So when we have these ethical dilemmas, we have these ethical situations that come up. Everybody seems to love to offer their, their, their opinion on it, right? Or they'll offer their opinion and it'll just be, that's unethical and not a solution or not another viewpoint or not another anything to contribute to the conversation or they'll throw deadlines, right? Like somebody will be like, that's unethical. You need to address this within 48 hours uh, or else you're going to the board. It's like, really? Come on. Like, like that's, that's your, that's your route. That's so ridiculous. So <clears throat> 
we have this intersection of all these things and they all contribute to people's decision making and they all contribute to how somebody's going to um, interact with with the profession how they're going to interact with other professionals um, and it's just not helpful to just start pointing fingers right so we start looking at ethics let's break it down a little bit more when we talk about ethics the focus is on these few basic questions i think are helpful for the field and we're kind of all trained on this right so what is the right thing to do what is worth doing what does it mean to be a good behavior analyst those are three questions that's not enough but that's a good start that's a good framework to kind of work within to begin your ethical decision making right we also have our ethics code and again i'm going to say this again the, sometimes the most ethical thing to do isn't legal Right? Sometimes we may have to violate some of those things to do the most, the, to do the right thing. Okay. And other times we may prefer to do things like, I don't know about you all, but I like, I like cookies. I like getting gifts from people, but I, and I would prefer to get those gifts and I would prefer to have a cup of coffee with a family, but I'm limited by the code. If that's something that becomes an issue, or I would prefer to serve somebody who's desperately in need, but it's outside of my scope, just barely, just enough that I have to worry about that. Right? So, I, I try to look at it like this when you start talking about ethics. Ethics should be where we want to be. It should be the gold standard. It should be this is where we strive to be and we strive to do better all the time, right? That's what our ethics standards are supposed to be. And then we get into morals. Our morals, the morals we talked about before are going to be that person's standards of behavior, their beliefs, uh, and it's usually informed by a history of learning related to right and wrong, what they're taught's right, what they're taught's wrong, what they're taught is professional, what's unprofessional, all that stuff. Um, and this is the standard of behavior, I think. This is the part that gets confused with ethical behavior. This is where people start having that discussion about like, this is what I believe behavior analysts should be versus this is what is ethical to do, okay? And also too, uh, just a note, I keep kind of talking about this where um, we keep talking about the code and the ethics in it. And there's some things that are unethical that are not in the code, right? Like, like stealing clients, right? That is kind of an ethical dilemma. It's a business ethics dilemma, but it's an ethical dilemma that comes up, right? And it's nowhere in the code that talks about taking clients from your agency and bringing them over to your next agency, right? So there are these things out there that, you know, it's not all inclusive, okay? So I think that's important to kind of recognize as we go through this. Now, ethical behavior is the standard for the field. Moral behavior is a personal standard, and it's important to discriminate those two things, okay? They can overlap, but moral, moral behavior and is gonna be a personal standard of behavior. It's a personal belief. And we have to take care not to impose our morals on our profession. That's something that we see far too often, right? And I see this right now where everything is heated, people are, are, are riled up, and there's a lot of really great social activism going on. But it's getting to a point where sometimes those morals, those professional standards, those, those personal beliefs, they get imposed on our profession without thinking about our science. They're not thinking about shaping, right? We're talking about these larger behavior changes without looking at how we can shape that behavior. So we have to be mindful of that as well. And just because it doesn't fit your standard doesn't mean it's unethical. And I think that's the thing that I want to try to get to everybody. And I feel like everybody here is pretty good. Okay. Like I feel like everybody here is like on, on that path, but um, you know, it's gonna, there are going to be times where you come across those people that are like, it's just a whole thing. It becomes a whole, I, that's the only way I can describe it. It's so frustrating. It's a whole thing. Okay. So now we've got our ethics, our professional standards. We've got our morals, which are our personal standards. And then we've got our preferences, which are just things that we like. Okay. When I work with folks, I like to work comfortably. I like to wear sneakers. Okay. That is not prof unprofessional. I like to wear sneakers. That's what I like. Okay. Um, I like to work in a certain, I like to work more in home and community-based services. That's my scope of practice, right? I like to talk about ethics. That's a preference of mine. That doesn't mean that I'm doing anything unethical and I have very specific preferences when it comes to those things. But when we talk about preferences, they also have to account and something that people forget are MOs, right? These transitory momentary effects that occur that influence our behavior. So when we talk about preferences right now in the moment, there are super strong MOs for social justice, right? And so we have this in place and it's important to note, but they are also transitory and momentary. They are going to be for a little bit while like everything is heated. When everything starts to settle down or we start seeing social change, those MOs are gonna change. And it's important to know that and recognize that as scientists, right? And some people have preferences for behavior they engage in. Like I have preferences for what I expect the behavior analyst to do. I have preferences for what supervision should look like. I have, and I also have ethical standards for what supervision should look like, but my preferences and my ethics standards and my morals all kind of collide within that space, okay? What we have to be mindful of, okay, is that 
we cannot confuse what we prefer with what our professional standard is, okay? What we prefer and what our standards are are two very different things, okay? They probably overlap, but they, are, they, they come from very different places. So as we start thinking about this, so now we've got our ethics, now we've got our morals, now we've got things that we like, we've got our preferences, and then we've got this legal issue, right? Which is our minimum standard. But the problem with the legal standards is that they come with a huge amount of punishers, right? And you violate it, you get reported, you lose your certification, you can get, a, you can get charged with something, right? Like, so, and there are a lot of codes related to legal issues. Don't implement contingencies that are gonna be fraudulent, illegal, unethical. Don't, uh, like you have to conform to legal ethics and codes, right? So you have all these things. Um, legal rights for our clients, huge things, right? And if behavior analysts believe there's a legal issue, we have to determine if there's a potential for harm and then report and so on and so forth. So they really harp on this idea of legal, 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 legal as part of our ethics code. So you have this kind of like ingrained situation where legal, ethics, and then we have, we impose our own professional standards, our own professional personal standards on this. And then just things that we like because we have this learning history, right? So now again, I go back to that question. I'm going to keep asking this. What happens when the legal standard isn't the most ethical decision in that moment? And that's where sometimes our challenge comes in, right? I'm not doing any harm. I think that I'm not doing any harm. I've consulted. It's, it's the least harmful thing to do, but it is illegal. If I consult with somebody else, they're going to tell me it's unethical. Now we have to kind of reconcile all these things that we weren't really prepared to reconcile. So now we're kind of in a funny spot. So I kind of liken it all to this. Okay. So if you're talking about the, the mountain of behavior anal analysis and you're talking about um, ethics and morals and principles and all these things, our legal standards are at the foot of the mountain. That's our base, right? That's where we start. That's our minimum. If we can get to the foot of the mountain, we're good. Okay. If we can get to that top of that mountain, that's our ethical standard. And we want to avoid Mordor altogether. Okay, that's what we want to avoid. That place is the dark place. We're going to avoid that because that's where, um, this, Brian, I did that just for you. I knew you love mountains. So, uh, but when we start talking about this, like we are in this place where it's, it, there's a spectrum of stuff, right? There's different levels of, of ethics and morals and legal, legal requirements, okay? So, and I think that we do a good job of recognizing that, that it is a spectrum sometimes, but there are always behavior analysts that apply ethics dilemmas and ethics codes too rigidly. And that's where you end up in a situation where it's, you do this or else, and that becomes a problem. So here's our problem, okay? Ethical policing, okay? How many times in Facebook groups, in chats, in, um, at conferences, do you hear the phrase, it's unethical, that's unethical? How many times do you see people approach situations like that without a solution? Do you all see that a lot? I see that, like, I feel like I see that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's so just, it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. So um, there's a whole reason why I'm not an admin for a Facebook group anymore. I cannot imagine doing that with, uh, with all the stuff that comes up. <laughs> yeah, it's real. it's, yeah, it, it's, it's unfathomable that this would happen, but it does happen, right? But the problem is, is like, not only are they just saying it's unethical and they're not offering a solution, it's aggressive and it is, it has implications, right? So that's unethical means I'm violating a code. That's unethical means I'm doing something wrong. That's unethical means that, I, that my certification is on the line. So like when people approach that's unethical, they don't approach it with thinking of those implications. They go, that's unethical, don't do that. It's like, well, tell me what to do instead. But also you're threatening me whenever you come at me like that. And all it does is create tension. It creates the situation. It creates these practices and behavior analysis where now there's a tension for no reason, where people can have these conversations. It doesn't really solve the problem. It doesn't really do anything. So um, I love, I've seen a lot of ethics talks with Tyra Sellers and she'll say like, approach these situations with curious, uh, compassionate curiosity. Ask the questions. Hey, maybe you didn't know. Maybe this is part of your learning history. Maybe this is a situation that came up and maybe this is what you were taught, but maybe there's a better way to do it because we're always kind of learning. And so the way she approaches this and the way that I've learned how to start doing this is approaching it from this place of understanding, not accusing. I'm not saying you're unethical. I'm saying just help me understand so I kind of know what your thought process is. So maybe we can figure out if there is some kind of broken link or a deficient skill somewhere, right? And you start doing this in supervision, obviously. You start working with your supervisors, but you have to do this with colleagues too. And you have to be able to be comfortable enough to approach this because we're ethically bound to address these, right? And, and this, this, I know this is not new information, but... It, like it's important to kind of frame where we're going next. So again, there's a confusion of ethics, morals, and preferences. You might prefer not to take the glass of water, okay? 
we prefer not to drink the cafecito, but if I want, if coffee's good. I like cafecito. I prefer, I, if I can get a cup of coffee, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, right? Um, but So we might not accept it, but when somebody else accepts it, is that unethical? Does that become an issue, right? Is that really a gift? And so that's, you see that, that low hanging fruit so much, but think of it like this. If I'm teaching some kind of social norm within a certain context, is it unethical to teach that if it counteracts cultural norms, right? Is that going to be an issue of personal bias? Like, I think this is a social norm, but maybe this isn't a social norm for this person or this group. So when we start doing that, why aren't we talking about those things? We're talking about the easy things. We're talking about things like just don't do it when it's like, there's probably some more significant issues that are going on. And this confusion becomes divisive, right? So when we start lacking in cultural awareness, cultural diversity, when we start lacking in understanding social significance, functional contextualism, all that stuff, when we start lacking in that, that's when we start getting really confused with things. And these debates become unnecessary ethics debates. You know, it's somebody imposing their preferences, their morals, their biases on a situation that has nothing to do with them or their perspective. I, I tell people all the time that behavior analysts have the weirdest job because we walk in, we tell a bunch of people what to do, and then we leave, right? We're like, hey, do this, implement this, go do this, okay? Here's some feedback, correct this. All right, see you later, right? And we're not living in those situations with those folks. And so that becomes a, a unique situation where, um, I mean, I just heard something the other day. Somebody was talking about a task analysis, and they wrote up this whole task analysis for a family, and they couldn't do it because that's not how they washed their clothes, right? Like, they were like, they had to write the task analysis and rewrite it based on how the family did their, their laundry, not how the, the behavior analyst of their laundry. And so it's like funny things like that that happen and it becomes divisive and becomes this whole debate about stuff. And these, a lot of these dilemmas become moral or preferential issues, not necessarily ethics issues, right? Because most of the time behavior analysts are not attempting to do harm and they're not really doing harm for the most part. They're just based, they're doing things based on their learning history. So what ends up happening are things like this. These real dilemmas get overlooked. Okay. And I know, um, we, I know the discussion of escape extinction has come up several times and just selecting treatment that makes sense for the context, that becomes a dilemma, right? I, per, I learned how to use extinction. So I, I prefer to use extinction, even though there might be a better treatment option and we might know more about the situation, right? Um, I might work outside of my scope. I might, you know, I've seen so many times where people, I've seen behavior analysts post about social stories. And then I see Justin Leaf just find that, find that article and find that post. And he's like, no, you know, like he <laughs> just smacks it down, which is, you know, it's you, when you start having those discussions, it's great to see, but those public statements become this larger issue. I've seen plenty of behavior analysts post stuff that doesn't make any sense. I've seen behavior analysts post about facilitated communication. So you're like, how did this even get here? Like, how do you support this? So um, these are real debates that are like, perpetrating our field. They're, sh they're shared in our field. They're, they're, they're perpetuating these bigger issues. Client dignity, right? Um, I'm starting to see this and I'm working on this myself as somebody who kind of came up in the field, this issue of client dignity, where you might share a funny story about a client, but you're like, what if that parent saw that story? What if that client saw that story, right? Like, so I'm starting to think about these things in a different way because while that's probably not necessarily an issue, like it might be, a, it might not be a moral standard for me. It might be an ethical standard because you're talking about somebody's dignity and respect and, and humanity. So all these things come up, right? These are all problems that are more significant than the glass of water, than the ornament, than the, than the, the drawing, the, than all that stuff, right? And it all gets confused because that's my standard of behavior. That's ethics. That's whatever it is. So what I want to do is I'm going to throw a couple scenarios and I want to kind of take some time to analyze whether it's an ethics issue, whether it's a morals issue, whether it's multiple things, and see if we can kind of have a discussion around this, if y'all are cool with that. So the first one is, Janice is working with a family from Cuba. In the first session with the family, the learner's mother offers Janice a cafecito, which is delicious, and Janice politely declines, stating that it would be unethical for her to accept coffee from the family. She references the ethics code specifically and notes that any gift would be an ethical violation. I started off easy on purpose, okay? So, is this an ethical issue? You type in the chat. This is, <laughs> yeah, you can type in the chat. Let us know. You can turn on your mic. You can say yes or no, whatever works. Is accepting the cafecito an ethics dilemma? Stephanie says no. <laughs> Megan, you just, you just undid my entire training. <laughs> it's a code issue, not an ethics issue. 
That's it. He figured it out. That's, what I, that's my problem. Right, so, so here's what it comes down to. Maybe, it might be an ethical dilemma because there are two codes that directly counteract one another, right? You've got 106, 105. You talk about, uh, I can't accept gifts, but I have to respect culture. So these two things counteract one another. So what's more harmful, right? At the end of the day, you have to analyze what's more harmful. If I don't accept it, am I gonna have rapport, right? Is it gonna turn into an issue? And those are things that you have to kind of look at when you talk about your ethical dilemma. So, and that is, goes into other situations. Right, so if I don't accept it, what's another code? It might be that I'm not providing the most effective treatment, right? I'm not individualizing my treatment. I'm not looking at all these other things that could influence that. Now, is this a moral issue? Is accepting the cup of coffee a moral issue? Yes, thank you, Michelle, it is more, it is more harmful to be an ass. I agree. So Ryan says, no, this is not a moral issue to accept the cup of coffee or to not accept the coffee. Okay. Yeah, I would say no. It's not a moral issue. It's not a personal standard. It's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I'm just not going to accept it because it's unethical. Now, is it a preference issue? <laughs> I like only if you grew up in a cult. <laughs> so Liz says yes. This is this is a a a preference issue, right? And I would agree to that. Like, I would for sure agree that this is a, a preference issue, right? Maybe I don't like coffee. Maybe I don't prefer to accept coffee. Maybe I feel um, uncomfortable accepting a cup of coffee from the family I work with, right? And then the last question is, is it a legal issue? Right, it's not a legal issue, right? It's unless you're stealing their coffee. If you like, if you like swiped their coffee and ran out, that might be a different issue. But it's not really any of those things. It's like really kind of like the dilemma becomes what can this lead to? It's really more of a preference. I prefer not to accept a cup of coffee. I feel more comfortable. But we have to kind of reconcile that with like, is this going to be a problem for rapport? Is this going to impact our treatment? Okay, so that's this is how we're going to analyze the next couple of them. Okay, so it's going to get a little bit more complex as we go. Elias is collaborating with a family who has a consistent religious routine. So their child, David, struggles with attending church functions. And uh, they, oh, I'm sorry, I should say uh, attending functions at the synagogue. Um, they ask Elias to attend sessions in the community with their, at the synagogue so that David can learn skills to participate in the event. In order to attend these sessions or hold these sessions, Elias must adhere to some religious practices like wearing a kippah and covering his tattoos. Elias is an atheist and has told the family that it would be unethical for him to participate in the sessions in this setting. Has anybody ever been in this situation where they've had to be, where they've had to do this? I worked in a, a Jewish school in Jacksonville. <laughs> Elias is the behavior analyst. So he's, I don't know, let's say 34. We'll put him in my age bracket. Oh, David is, uh, let's say 10. So let's look at this, okay? So is this an ethical issue? I had to sign something saying I wouldn't drink, cohabitate with someone in the opposite sex or dance. Oh, wow. Nice, Megan. That's good. I've never had to sign that. I did have to wear a kippa, which was funny because when I had to wear it, my head is too big and I didn't know how to like attach it to my head. So I couldn't like keep it on. So I was uh, constantly adjusting it. But that was a problem because I would lift my arms up and my tattoos would show whenever I do that. So it was a the whole thing. So I would say, yes, this becomes an ethical issue. And here's why, okay? So if, if Elias is saying no, it becomes an issue of possible discrimination based on religion, right? You could make the argument for that. It's also an ethical issue because it has to do with Elias's personal preference and personal conflicts, right? So it's a dilemma, not because what he, it's not unethical for his decision. The dilemma comes from, am I discriminating or am I honoring my own preferences and understanding my own personal biases? That's the dilemma, right? So, and so Ryan said, uh, yeah, uh, transfer a case. It's, it's yeah. And, and that's exactly it. Right. And that's probably what I would look at is like, you know, maybe I can, if I can't do this, if I can't get past my personal bias, that might be a thing, right? That's that's where my dilemma comes into play. Um, and yeah, and, and, and Liz, like you said, you need to be aware of different cultures you work with. So there is like a level of that, right? Like I have to be able to understand and work in that context, but to, there's also like, can I get past the religious practice myself? 
and that becomes like a personal issue, right? So there's, that's where your, that's where your struggle comes in and it gets a little bit more complex, right? Okay. So now is this a moral issue? Does this become a moral issue? So we see personal beliefs. Yeah, I would say, yeah, right. This becomes a moral issue, right? Because this is a personal standard, right? As an atheist, I say, I, I will not participate too, in any sort of religious practices, which I feel like is a, uh, an interesting hill to die on. Like if that's your route, like then stop celebrating Christmas, you know, like that's that whole thing. So I have that, mo like, that's a, it's an interesting thing. Like, to kind of navigate that. So yes, it becomes a moral issue because that becomes a personal preference. That becomes a personal standard of behavior. Um, this is a preference issue. I prefer not to go to church if I don't have to, but this is, does it become a legal issue? I, I, is this it, in itself a legal issue? I see some no's. I see it, it could be. Not yet, I like that. Yeah, not right now in this moment, but it could be as long as it's transferred, right? Like, I mean, if it's not transferred, if it's not, if the services aren't effective, if you're telling somebody I can't practice because of your religious practices and the context, that becomes a possible discrimination issue. So that's where you have to kind of figure out these alternative solutions, right? While, the, while we can kind of check off these boxes, like yes, no, maybe, like we still have to have that other solution. How can we transfer services? Is there somebody else to transfer the service to, right? Because I live in Ormond Beach. There's all of 20 behavior analysts that live in my town um, for 150,000 people that live in this city, maybe. So there's not a lot of people that can service all the folks that need it. Okay. So now we run this issue of, it could be a legal issue if it goes too far. Okay. So now we're getting more complex. We're getting a little bit hairy here. Karen is a behavior analyst at the organization. So watch out managers. And you are currently working there. Karen has recently reviewed your treatment plan and has made some excellent notes about changes that could be made. However, she made a comment about your intervention for food selectivity. She notes that her, in her training, she learned that escape extinction was the most appropriate intervention and that it would be unethical to use another intervention. Okay, it's always about interventions, right? So is this an ethical issue? <laughs> Stephanie, yeah. Yeah, yikes, right? Now, I mean, to be, to be fair, we know escape extinction works. Coming out with a is it unethical? One. If she's only making recommendations, so, I don't know. She's making, maybe she's my supervisor. My first two thoughts were like, am I doing any sort of harm is I my first thought. And then my second thought hot. would be um, usually just Especially a rundown, I guess three, rundown of like, are there any codes right, so potentially? So if I think it's something, um, I check those. And then I always went straight to another behavior analyst. <laughs> I like that. Like yeah. If I had any I doubt, like I went to another yeah. behavior I mean, I would say maybe, right? This sure. becomes a dilemma uh, for sure. I always looked at these as something where it's like, make my quick... Just the situation of my, where clients have a right to affect uh, the moment. We know escape reaction. extinction works, but we if know there's probably to a better way to do it. So why would we go to escape really extinction? Why would we say that any other intervention uh, was ineffective analyst. or or unethical? I don't know. So we run into this that's issue, a lie, right? But like I remember having some right, and that's exactly what I would say, Selena. We need to know a little bit more. Uh, least restrictive and this was like too. And so there are other codes that look at like we look at here. And so we have to apply all those. I would definitely say there's a dilemma. I think that we need to look at. There's probably some more information. But does this become a moral issue? And I don't know either, Ryan. That's I don't do food stuff. Like I'm just like not a food guy. So does this become a moral issue though? I would say no, but maybe I think you can make the argument for yes too. Um, yeah, why is it or go to? And that's probably more. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there you go, Stephanie. I appreciate that. So I would say, no, it's not necessarily a personal standard. It might be a professional standard that she's like maybe like a learning history issue. So I would probably lean into really heavy that this is a preference issue, uh, less than a, than, a, than a moral issue. But you could make the argument that like, hey, she's, she's applying a personal behavior standard to the situation, right? So uh, I'm starting to lose the distinction between moral issues and preferences. Yeah, it becomes, a, it becomes this weird thing, right? Like it becomes a challenge. Um, and I think that's the challenge that we face, right? Like I have a, a standard, a, a professional, a personal standard, but my preferences are gonna shift and change. So it becomes a little bit challenging. And that's, I think, part of the problem with this discussion, right? So, but moral and preference issues are still not necessarily ethics issues when we approach them. 
So is the summary of uh, it's about as effective or better than past escape extinction? So yeah, right. That's I mean that's what we have to look at. So so we have to look at like maybe escape extinction works, maybe it is effective, but maybe there's a more effective way to look at it, or maybe a more effective way to approach it. So okay, yeah, and so many not not hundred percent sure the com the comparison. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. So very effective and, and less restrictive, right? So that's the other side of it. It's, it's least restrictive. So there's more dignity. There's other codes that go in here, right? Okay, cool. And so then the other question is, is this a legal issue? Yeah, gamification, right? Does this become a legal issue? If we're gonna go ahead and jump into escape, escape extinction, I know. Well, because like I think I think like Vincent said, like you start to kind of lose like, is this a moral issue? Is this a preference issue? Even with like what we know about this, it could be any of these things. Like, and I think that goes back to like this. It depends. And I think this is probably why this uh, this discussion is so tough. I would say this could be a legal issue, right? Like, I'm not using the most effective treatment. Um, it becomes a standard of practice to use escape extinction. Maybe it's costing the family money. So maybe they're, the results are poor or there's malpractice issues. Like there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then that's exactly it. It becomes a, a whole different issue. Is there a parent consent thing? Um, yeah. I, it, and it might be a moral issue too. So I said no, just off the bat, but I, I could make, you could make the point that it would be a moral issue, right? Like I don't have, I personally don't have a, standard that I would hold somebody to that they have to use extinction, right? That becomes a personal behavior standard, right? And I think that's probably maybe where people are getting hung up. So I'm not the, I'm not like the end all be all of that decision. So, and I think that's kind of the discussion as we go through this, like it could be any of those things. Thinking more about the treatment of the client. <laughs> Megan, can you, can you, will you turn on your mic and elaborate a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I didn't see the actual scenario description because you're going really fast, but <laughs> um, just in general, when thinking about extinction, um, yeah. Yeah, so basically. Yeah, so, so from the moral standpoint, what I would say is when we're thinking about, and I, I could be misunderstanding what you're saying about considering morals. So for just how like dignity and humanity come up for me for moral like when we're thinking about morals and like if you're if you're truly treating a client like a human and recognizing the qualitative effects your behavior has on them and um looking at that piece of it like would start to bring in morality to me yeah and i think that's where you start to have that overlap uh, if i'm being honest i think that's where like ethics and morals do tend to overlap where it's like you know ethically we have a dignity issue morally, that is also a personal standard that I hold where I want to maintain this person's dignity. It's a value, right? So like there are that, I think that's where the Venn diagram overlaps for those. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, it's been normalized in our field. Uh, you and I especially have a long history where it might not, like in the past, it might not have come up for me morally, even though I present on this all the time. Um, but when I first started, we, I was trained so much that like, it's not a big deal. It's better for them, blah, blah, blah. Um, so like morality probably wouldn't have even come up, but like the more I've learned over the years and especially listening to various perspectives of people that have experienced the interventions, that's when the morality piece starts to come up more for me too. Yeah. And I, and I don't think that, I think, I, and I think that's exactly it. It's like, I don't think that having a, a moral compass in this situation or any of these situations is a problem until you are applying it to the stage where you're going, that's unethical. And I think that like, you know, most of the time people don't have that other side of it where they're like, this is an ethics and a moral issue. They'll go, that's unethical, but it's really a moral issue and doesn't really apply in the code. Like in this situation, I would say 100% escape extinction does not maintain somebody's dignity in, in this situation. Right. So that becomes a moral and an ethics issue that, that there are specific codes for that, but sometimes you won't see that. Sometimes people will be like, that's unethical. It's like, because I wore a t-shirt to a conference like that is like, that's probably the easier discrimination with that right this one gets a little bit muddy because there is there are ethical implications to forcing somebody to eat broccoli so that's why we we make these discussions there's no right or wrong answer all right so it can become it can become a legal issue if there's a malpractice situation okay 
So that's what I would say here. All right, this is, my, this is my favorite example from this. All right, Lothric is a behavior analyst and one of your friends on Facebook. He might be described as opinionated and shares articles um, from some less than reputable resources. So recently you see him share the Vax documentary, uh, telling people that sheep will need to wake up. He's told you that NASA was created to prevent us from discovering that the earth was flat. And this person who is a scientist yeah, woo -woo. working in a science field is sharing non-evidence-based <laughs> research to the masses. <laughs> yeah, sheeple is not my favorite, not my favorite term. So is this an ethical issue? So keep in mind, he's sharing yeah, stuff you. that's not behavior analytic. So he's not sharing this within the behavior analytic realm. This is, this is outside of that. So is this an ethics issue? Because we all have that friend that keeps touting essential oils. Not from inside of it. Yeah, not yet, right? So I would say it could be, but it's not really. When it gets outside or gets into behavior analysis, yeah, it becomes an issue, right? Now, the code that I would reference here talks about maintaining competence in, uh, in the appropriate literature, but it focuses on behavior analytic work. It doesn't focus on science, right? Um, it might be an ethical issue for another scientific community that he belongs in, and that might be the issue. Or it might be, it could lead into a situation where now people are choosing, I don't know, chelation over getting behavior analytic services. So that's where it might become an ethical dilemma for behavior analysis is when there is an effective treatment for something and they're going, mm, now this person's sick because they're not getting what they need. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's what we have to start looking at, Megan, is like, can we discriminate between personal life and understanding those personal preferences in that situation versus application? Are they giving articles to families and going, hey, did you watch this Vax article or Vax documentary? And that's when it becomes kind of a, a unique situation, right? So is this a moral issue? Is this a personal standards preference? Yeah, it really is. It really is. Reliance on scientific knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. So this becomes a moral issue, right? This is a personal standards issue for sure. And this is something that we probably all struggle with because we all have family members that tell us that our psychobabble bullshit doesn't work and all that fun stuff. I've had those family members that have said that, right? Um, this is definitely a preference issue. And this could be a legal issue, especially if somebody gets harmed, right? Like, and that's where it becomes a legal issue. If somebody does end up getting harmed, that's where it becomes like a real serious ethics issue, but it also becomes this legal issue. So as we start digging into this, I'm not going to do the last scenario because I want to cover a couple of different tips, but um, we start looking at creating an ethical environment. So, so the goal here is not to harp on ethics, not to set up the, set the occasion for um, calling people unethical. It's really kind of like becoming the model for what's ethical and how to be preventative so we can continue to foster ethical discussions instead of being reactive and addressing ethical dilemmas in a way that is aggressive. Like we wanna make sure that we foster the discussion. So some tips on creating it from a prevention standpoint. So practice, 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 practice. And this is something I do in supervision a lot is where I go and bring dilemmas to folks and have those discussions. Um, I think that there are some situations where people can have discussions about ethical dilemmas without it being too heavy uh, and without getting too combative. In ethics CEUs, we have that. Um, how many of you are part of like an ethics work group or consultation groups that do have and discuss ethics dilemmas or um, get to present things and kind of work through situations like that? Does anybody take part in something like that that's not, um, like that's maybe within an organization or maybe with people that you trust? Yeah, okay, so that currently we have in the past, yeah. Informally, yeah, a lot of us do that kind of informally, I think, so. Yeah, and, it, and I think that's important, right? Like having those discussions and being able to share and work with those groups and be able to kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good stuff though. Like, and so that's a prevention piece. Like that's where you have a group of people that can work together and have those discussions and listen and work on solutions and be able to present stuff that, um, yeah, and, and exactly it. I need a consult, right? Like that's where, you, that's your prevention. Like that's your having the discussion. That's getting some advice before you make a decision. So. Oh, no worries, Selena. We'll see you soon. All right, so when we start teaching it, when we start hosting events, hosting discussions, I mean, round tables, having this, like the fact that we're all here is a, a teaching opportunity for us to have the discussion around ethics and what that looks like, right? Um, we wanna use multiple exemplars. Like we don't, we wanna avoid the situations where we're just talking about, uh, 
uh, we're just talking about coffee, right? Or those gifts. And so, uh, Megan, it's important to remain intellectually curious and venture outside the field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing somebody brought up to me today, which I thought was really cool, was studying the philosophy of ethics in general, not necessarily ethics in behavior analysis, but understanding and, and really studying ethics as a philosophy. So I think that's really, really cool. So um, just having a good foundation for that. Uh, somebody, that's so funny that you brought that up because that's exactly what somebody said earlier. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, yes, please, please share those. That'd be great. Um, so we want to use multiple exemplars. We don't want to use the same coffee cup example. Yeah. We don't want to use the same yeah, treatment integrity example. We don't want to use the same parent training example. Comments, we want to use multiple sorry, examples, distracted. right? Uh, we, when we're doing supervision, we want to allow the learner to come up with some solutions, right? Like, so, so we want to kind of have them work through it and kind of see their thought process and make those decisions as well. So um, professional ethics, which is on topography. Yeah, isn't that funny how it works? So westernized. It's so, it's so black and white. Um, and one thing that we want to demonstrate too, and we want to make sure that people know is like that, that ethics aren't always easy. These discussions aren't always easy. The decisions aren't easy. And sometimes successes and failures happen and being able to highlight those failures, right? Being it, when you teach somebody that you make ethical decisions, sometimes you make the wrong decision. Sometimes somebody gets hurt. Sometimes you, you, you end up in a situation that you shouldn't end up in. Everyone's right. So and quiet. that I think is, is important. So, um, Every time Anton leaves me, my reading list exponentially grows. Yet Michelle always, right? That's that's the issue that we run into. There's so many readings. So, um, so as we start kind of digging into this, it's under, it's important to kind of highlight the good and the bad and the ugly too, right? And so when we manage these dilemmas, okay, we approach each dilemma with compassionate curiosity and kind of going back to what Megan was say, saying, intellectual curiosity and, and being able to approach these from a place of compassion and humanity, really, right? Uh, it's possible the dilemma wasn't a... a, a part of this person's learning history or they, they were never taught how to deal with that or they're missing a skill or they simply didn't know because they had a really poor model for their supervision experience right um i did not have a lot of great models during my supervisory experience early on and i had to learn kind of what the model was and what works and what doesn't so another part of this is we want to guide the learner in the uncharted territory. Do not use trial by fire. I mean, I've seen this a lot where it's like, well, just figure it out. Like you want to be there to like help somebody through that situation. And you want to provide that praise and feedback, but you want to debrief after the dilemma has ended too. So like you have to be able to, when you're working with a learner, go back and say, so what do you think worked? What didn't work? What would you do differently? How would you, and, and be able to give that person the opportunity to kind of like course correct after the fact. If you don't do that, then you're missing really key opportunities to teach somebody a different path or to kind of problem solve the next time that dilemma comes up. So my primary take home points, and we'll open it up for a few questions, but behavior analysts have to develop skills to discriminate between ethical, moral, and preferential situations, right? We have to be able to do that. And it's not always easy. Um, and it's not always clear. And there are Venn diagrams that kind of overlap. And not everyone that we work with is bound to our code. So I see this a lot where people will go, that speech pathologist is doing something unethical. And it's like, they have their own code. Like let them, let them have their own code. We're there, they're, it's a whole thing, all right? The word unethical is used without measure, without consideration, without compassion, without humanity. And that becomes a real problem for our field. That is creating a culture of our field of attacking and not necessarily approaching or correcting or even understanding, right? This idea of compassionate curiosity for all parties involved is necessary, right? We have, in order to resolve the dilemma, we have to understand the function of the behavior, what's going on, um, and moral dilemmas themselves, those personal preferences, those personal standards are not within the scope of understanding or trying to resolve that ethical dilemma that's coming up, not always, right? Ethical dilemmas are messy, they require flexible thinking, and there's not always a right answer. If there's a right answer, there might not always be that situation, and functional contextual ethics Put the perspective to work so we have to apply that to the context we can't just say that's unethical without having more information so and i think that we can i think this is not new information for folks but it's important i, I want to reiterate that because i think that we can create a culture around this so that's all i really have as far as uh it's great yeah, yeah there that is a great that is a great read so that's all i really have have as far as content goes but do we, there were a couple of questions that were sent in anonymously that I thought were really cool. So um, I'll do these and then um, we'll open it up for questions real quick. So the first one is, do Facebook groups represent an ABA workplace um, that would be under the purview of the BACB ethics code uh, for both clearly behavior analytic, analytic 
in nature versus not. So I think, I think that becomes a unique situation, right? Cause there are some Facebook groups that are organization based that are sharing information that might not be social, like scientifically sound. I think that some ABA groups are not using public disclosures. So it, that one gets a little bit iffy, right? So, so yeah. <laughs> what do what do you all think about that? Brian, you had something to say about was, that one? I was kind of thinking on this, like, you, I think you see most people just say like, this doesn't constitute professional advice. And like, it seems like that's a pretty solid way to get around it. Um, but I, I don't, I haven't yet seen this be like really pressed and presented. I feel like in our community, like we haven't had the kind of trial where somebody really tries to push this and like, does that hold its weight? Cause the disclaimer might be there, but like, if that's still what you're doing in that group, then that gets really really iffy really quick um i feel like if your business is tied directly to the group although that shouldn't seem to matter and it doesn't necessarily differentiate on the ethics list i could see someone taking that more seriously because it's easier right to say like no you're providing this service um to people so like, the one that i think of first was the 1.01 like the reliance on scientific knowledge and I think that's what I see come up most frequently is like, are we relying these things based on scientific knowledge? And when there's a gap in that knowledge, uh, such as an experience or a perspective that someone may share that may be socially valid, and we don't have the data to look at the validity of that on like a larger level than that individual person's perspective, then I think that's where it gets super muddy. And we just don't have an answer right now for that. So what like that's got to go through trial. Does that make sense? Like, what do we do as a field when we start to do that? Um, have that dilemma. I don't know. Um, I see the arguments on both sides at the moment. I like, I like, uh, like the, the basically saying at the end of the day, um, the, do not take this as recommendation is basically just saying no offense, but yeah, right? like this is not professional opinion, but it's, it's just no offense, but and yeah. then you just, or this isn't professional advice, but it really is. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's masked. Right. Yeah. So, well, I think, I think that's the challenge too. Cause I mean, you'll see in some Facebook groups or you'll see in some situations where uh, people will post those recommendations and they're nowhere near behavior analytic, or they are offering advice about something that they don't have enough information or context about. Yeah. So that becomes a really unique thing. Um, and it's funny to see, it's interesting to see that folks will continue to do that. And nobody really like yeah. says like, Hey, this might be a problem folks. Like this, this might be a situation that you should probably not get into. So and I think, I think there's like layers to this behavioral analytic or not. So if this is something where you're starting to provide, um, if you have a BCBA, for example, leading the discussion or there's a CU tied to it, like you start to get more layers deep, right. Of like, you're kind of ingraining, like this is a behavioral analytic approach to these things. Um, so that that end thing there is like if you are i think these groups i think you could get away with more of it if your group wasn't behavior analytic in nature but that's where like the devil's in the details like if it's being ran by a group of behavior analysts but it's not behavior analytic like the more attention it garners and the less scientific knowledge or things like that start to pop up i think the more you're just going to run into um calls that this is unethical right yeah that makes sense so that was one question the other one was is it unethical to allow discussion to occur among people who are anti-aba self-advocates for how aba has been harmful and i think this is a great question and a timely question i would say no um i think that it does it, i think it's ethical to understand our history and understand the dignity of the folks that are experiencing the treatment and all that i think that there is something inherently ethical about having the discussion i think what becomes unethical or not even unethical i think it becomes a a, a basic human issue is when the discussion becomes aggressive or it is not progressing forward in a way that's meaningful or respectful or becomes like it becomes a human issue i think at some point in time like i think because i think at the end of the day like you'll have folks that will share information like i remember we posted something not too long ago and uh had a whole bunch of people who are like ABA is abusive and would throw like articles from like 1977 at me and so i'm like 
well, that's a little outdated. Like that becomes an issue where that's not even representative of the current field. It is a representative of our history. There are moments like that, but then even having that like tone policing becomes an issue. So like having the discussion, I think, I don't think it's unethical to allow people to talk about it. I think it becomes a respect or uh, a human issue when people can't have a constructive conversation about it. I yeah, think that is my, where I would go with that. Uh, my thing would be like, the uh i guess first of all is it is it within the purview of the group's context and what they're trying to solve not that that makes it unethical or not but like that's the first thing i think of that we think of with these groups is like is this the type of conversations that we have here um it's not by any any means i don't think unethical to to have the discussions i think where it gets muddy is uh what sort of value do we assign to those as a scientific community? And so when we're looking at the social validity um, and perspectives, and we almost treat that as like data of an end of one from one person, right? Like for like where, how representative of that uh, is that of like the totality of services and what's being delivered. And we don't have that information. I don't know if it's out there like we're not doing any great large group sampling of data and perspectives like at all in our field so um for example like it's very ripe and easy to see those conversations um start cherry picking information or overextending or creating straw man arguments like there's there's just logical fallacies galore and that is interesting because we don't have specific training on in behavior analysis but logical fallacies in a scientific framework don't work and so in a way it's like it's pretty ripe and easy for even behavior analysts to get sucked into non-logical and like non-coherent arguments um, that while aren't directly listed in our code of like thou shall always be logical like they are part of the scientific knowledge and always be coming from a scientific perspective so it's weird it's like this dilemma of i hear your perspective but we don't have enough information on this on a larger level to really know what to say as a science so we're stuck in this opinion-based world, I think, there right now as a scientific community. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is like, that's where it gets muddy is because you've got folks that are like, this is a problem and people are like, but that's not the problem. This is, this is an experience versus the structure and just people don't know how to like find a middle ground on that, I think. Like, I think that's part of the, like you said, like the science community doesn't know how to talk yeah. about it, but also I think the, the folks that are experiencing it probably don't know how to, um, work together hand in hand to make that. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of lurkers on these groups too, to where like, we know going all the way back to Bandura and others like modeling of behavior can get shaped up really quick and, and extended elsewhere, um, and imitated by people. So, um, I think that's one thing that people are worrying about right now is like not seeing the thorough breakdown of the situation and like, what can we, take from a perspective and how can we elaborate or extend that onto maybe a certain type of service. So if someone's had a treatment experience that is reported as unhealthy, traumatic, et cetera, what it, like, we don't see that usually move from like, okay, how would we start to really figure this out as a scientific community? Like you don't see that logically broken down and discussed thoroughly analyzed and then set up to where it's like, okay, now we have a trajectory of how we can assess whether or not this is traumatic in the future for our clients. Like it breaks down after the opinions start getting thrown around. Right. And I think so. that's what people are uncomfortable with is like, they want to see that discussion had at a more deep level, which is really hard to have unless you're face to face on the phone. You're right. Like, right. Start and, willing to listen. Section. and willing to listen without being yeah, defensive. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big yeah. part of it too. So, all right, guys, I hate to do this, but I have to run personally. Right. So, Enjoy yourselves. Thank you for having me. I appreciate y'all. And I will stick around and we can keep chatting about this for a second.